welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, a not-for-profit research and advocacy group. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. Before I introduce this week's guest, I would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place, now known as Australia. We respect the elders of the past and present, and we are grateful for the continuing care of the lands, waterways and skies where we listen, learn and thrive. This week, I am pleased to welcome Professor Kim Cuneo, Head of the School of Music at the Australian National University. He is an activist composer interested in old and new musics and the role of intercultural music in making sense of our larger world. Welcome, Kim, and thank you for joining me. Rebecca, thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to be a part of this. Now, I've got to ask, because I'm sure some of our listeners will be wondering, how does music relate to sustainability? This might be the only question you need to ask. That's my little joke. But the funny thing is, musicians... At first, we think of them as the entertainment. And what I've really been making a point of trying to do at the ANU is to say, actually, music is a part of the great struggles of our world. So there's no reason why a musician or music makers shouldn't be a part of climate change debates or the ecology or any part of it. So very much in my work, but also increasingly the work of the school I'm a part of, we're thinking about these notions of what role does a musician play in the great struggles of our time? And that's everything from your wonderful acknowledgement of country to thinking about what is the role of a music maker in First Nations reconciliation? And I do want to also say that I extend my love and respect to all our First Nations people, particularly any First Nations listeners. I'm coming from Blessed Nunnaw or Nambri virtual waves. But all of us, we know that there's two telling things in Australia as a country right now. There's Indigenous reconciliation that needs to be done much, much better, a transferring of power and identification of Indigenous knowledge practices and bringing that into our ways of being. And then there's the fact that we are in an environmental crisis. So we can ignore it if we want to, no matter what our discipline, but we'd be far better not doing it. So that's my quick answer. Musicians should play a part and they need to play a part because otherwise we'll be left behind. What's the point in just singing sweet love songs when the world is burning? Yeah, that's a great point because, of course, no matter who we are, we're all part of this one world and, you know, we're having to deal with the struggles. So it makes sense that we all have our part to play and that music has a great part in having cultural voice. Now, we've covered quite a few of the sustainable development goals in this podcast. One of the ones that we haven't really touched on so far is SDG 10, which is about reduced inequalities. Do you mind if we talk about that a little bit today? I'd be really happy to because it's big part of my work at the ANU and also the ANU is launching a new strategic plan and thinking about this goal is a part of the ANU's new plan which is really exciting. Okay can you tell me a bit more about the plan? Yep so every five years the ANU relooks at its role as a national university and we're led by this really I'm, I don't want to be too gushy but our vice chancellor is a guy I really admire Brian Schmidt first of all because he's smart enough to win a Nobel Prize for discovering that the rate of expansion of the universe is actually slowing down which is just sort of way beyond us sort of normal people but then he applies it into thinking if we have a national university what role does it play in the national debate and a big part of it is saying that this needs to be the place that is available for people regardless of race creed or privilege. So making the notion of tertiary study and elite tertiary study not elitist is really a big part of what the ANU is on right now. And there's a number of initiatives and then a number of initiatives also in my music school that we've applied it with. But in the broad part of the ANU, we have a thing called the Cambry Scholarships, which is quite an amazing thing. It's actually looking at people's potential as well as their academic merit. So the whole idea is to get people from regional areas, people from rural areas, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, people from First Nations, and people who are genuinely excellent but have not been given the same sense of fosterment when they were young. So there's a really big project to get more people of diverse backgrounds, which I'm, of course, really proud to be a small part of. But I think it goes far beyond that. It's about saying, what is a university today? You know, and we can say initially a university was this place of great learning, a place of combining the things that often don't make sense, so getting beyond binary oppositions. And as we know, in our last generation, universities have become really prosaic places to prepare people for mainstream economic development, to play your part in making money for the big end of town. Part of what it's on is actually saying that we can be a loving, critical voice to enable young people to gain their own loving, critical voice about what's not working in the world. So they're the fundamental concepts that the ANU is working with. 
And the idea is to make these places available, but then also to look at creating a set of skills and a desire in people who are studying to not just be passive observers of the inequalities of our world. So the idea is, yes, you've been given something, but you actually have to then make more of it. And I can give you a small example. We had our graduations this week, and in my area, which is the College of Arts and Social Sciences, we had a very young, amazing guest speaker who came from a background where, you know, two generations ago, it was people literally selling kebabs on the streets of Malaysia to then this young woman being in a position where she'd just been appointed a Rhodes Scholar, which is quite amazing. So sharing this fact that with the privilege and the opportunity comes an incredible responsibility is what our big institutions need to do. Unfortunately, I think we could say they too often don't do that, but I certainly want to be a part of making that more available. Yeah, I think that's a big thing in our culture as well is that we get very focused on our rights as citizens but don't really consider our responsibilities to one another. Yeah. Can I talk a bit about my discipline? Because in my discipline it's classic what happens because music and particularly what we might call elite music, and this is a really funny term because you know music schools like mine, they were set up to teach what we will call the conservatoire model of music. In other words, a high art European tradition. You know, we could say it starts with people like Monteverdi to Bach and Mozart and Beethoven. It's the Western classical tradition, which is incredible, right? And then it goes into the Western avant-garde of the 20th and the 21st century. But there's not much thought in the initial design of these places about what Australia was becoming. In other words, Australia was a multicultural society, as Australia was a diverse society, as Australia as the place where there's multiple genders and ways of thinking about sexuality. So we have this idea that the founding principles are inherently conservative in music schools, hence the name conservatoire. There's this thing that sort of says we're keeping this thing that's really important to people who like tradition. But then we can say, where's the innovation? The sort of people who can get into a music school like mine are the sort of people whose parents can pay for them to take music lessons from about the age of five. So there's an investment of between fifty and dollars and $100,000 in music lessons for the average classical or high-end jazz musician to come to a music school. So we can see that on the face of it, a music school is almost completely representative of the class inequalities of a country like Australia and in most of the developed world, unless the the tuition is free and very inclusive. So we have a big task to do to say, how can we actually make, you know, not only available, but welcome people who don't come from that privileged background and find a way to teach what they need to know. And it involves studying popular music much more. It involves studying hybrid musics, working with computers, thinking about world musics, but the term world music is problematic. But actually saying that there were all these other types of music besides the the two types that are mainly taught in music schools. Diversity has a way of reducing those inequalities because it reduces the prejudice that people form when they're not interacting with one another. So I can see how that would be very helpful in the music world to diversify the music that you're teaching and listening to and engaging with. Is that why you developed your interest in intercultural music or did it start before then? You know, that's a really good question. And this is now me, Kim, as a person. Uh, You know, I come from, you know, one of those hybrid backgrounds. My father is an Iraqi Jew who grew up in China. So he was born in 1920. So he's he's, uh, left the body now. But his experience is very much an intercultural experience and particularly in that crucial period of between the wars and then World War II really threw his life apart. And my mother is a Burmese and Indian Jew. So there's very much a a Far Eastern subcontinental feeling in the cultures that I grew up with. And then I was fortunate to grow up in Australia, which I think with all its little flaws is an amazing place and an amazingly open society. And I loved growing up. But as I grew up, I had to really make sense of who I was, these sort of multiple identities. This also a notion of being partly Arabic and then of a Jewish persuasion. I had to think about where I stood on notions like Israel and Zionism and anti-Semitism. So I had to think about all of those notions and what it meant to have significant Indian cultural heritage. So I, I guess you'd say I was naturally intercultural. And then when I studied music, there was no room for people like me. You know, it's quite a long time ago and I was basically a weirdo. So I had to sort of fit into a dominant system. I didn't learn Western music as a child. I had to take it on as an adult and get really good at it quickly to survive in the system. And then as soon as I started to become a professional musician, I felt I had a role to play 
to actually combine all of my cultures and make sense of my own life, but then to think if there's a methodology for other people to do it as well. And I came in at a time where I guess you'd say there's a world interest in thinking about hybrid musics much more. And we have things like the real world label, Peter Gabriel, this notion of traditional music suddenly being able to sell records, interest in really landmark ensembles like the Guto Monks of Tibet. So there became maybe an exotic other in music that could sell records, which then started to furnish a, a deeper interest in some musicians. We had people like John McLaughlin, who's this you know incredible mainstream jazz guitarist going to India and spending years you know developing the group Shakti with Saki Hussain, and saying actually I'm going to meet as an equal rather than having the Western privilege as the big prism. I can throw away my Western privilege and see what can happen with a long-term collaboration. So that's the world I've come in in on, and I find it really exciting to work in this way. So you want to change the system and now you're working uh, in your professional life to try and make a place. I think you've said it really well and you said it also very nicely before, you know, we have rights and responsibilities. So I think I took advantage of my rights in a great country like Australia to get a really good education. I mean, I love education as an arbiter of success for people, you know, it's because suddenly we're not thinking about materialism. We're thinking about knowledge as a representation of power and a way to change things. So for me, I, I love using that which I've been given in a responsible way and having the chance for a number of years now to head up a pretty prestigious and wonderful music school in a wonderful university, there's a chance to try things out. And it, it really is exciting to think that with a bit of goodwill, you can make a lot of mistakes but get really amazing things done over time with wonderful colleagues. And that's really very much what my life is now. Maybe I could tell you about the initiative I'm most proud of, which is intercultural but also deeply important about our restoration with First Nations people, which is we've had a huge pivot, the first of its kind in a music school in Australia, to say that we will have First Nations leadership and consultation throughout every aspect of our music school. So we're not a huge music school, but we now have six staff who are First Nations in our music school. And so that is changing the game because it means for anyone who comes and studies at this place, you're going to actually meet First Nations people all the time. And on top of that, we also have a free national First Nations recording studio called Yilal, named after the song by the legendary Aboriginal singer-songwriter Uncle Joey Gaia, where any First Nations person, although not any at the same time because it's only one studio, but any First Nations person can come to Canberra and record their work for free with us. We also provide mentoring where we're looking at mid-career Indigenous artists to try and take them to the next level. We have a composers collective, which we train for free. We have 15 Indigenous composers who've changed the landscape of art music in Australia. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on in that place that we think is really important. And all of it, which is the founding principle, is Indigenous-led. And I think that's the really important bit. It's not me saying to Indigenous people, do this. It's Indigenous people saying to me, we're going to do this. You got a problem with that? I'm going, no. We had NIDOC week. Did you do anything at your university to celebrate that? Yeah, NADOC Week's a big part of the ANU. So there had just been before NADOC a really big conference on First Nations restoration, which had people from around the country. You know, the thing about the ANU is it has people from 50, 60 different disciplines. So this is what I love about universities. You've got people who have expertise in all these things coming together. And so we have these big round tables. We also have a couple of First Nations portfolios there. So they're literally determining amazing stuff. So that was going on and a couple of our affiliated musicians were playing at that, which is really lovely. So we have two pretty eminent musicians who are involved in that. One is William Barton, the didgeridoo virtuoso, who's uh, our associate professor in Indigenous performance. It's actually a trial for him. He's the busiest guy in Australia, really. But at the same time, we wanted him to be housed part of his work in a university. So we're working all that out as we go along, which is really exciting. And we also had a great guy called Dobby, who's uh, an Indigenous classical rapper who also performed. And, and so Dobby has a degree in percussion, so he can play like really fast as a Western percussionist. But he's got this idea that rap is really a big part of particularly youth Indigenous cultures in Australia, but also it's the ability to look at larger Black Lives Matter struggles that he feels is really important. So we had these two guys doing stuff around about the NADOC time, and then we're developing, over NADOC, we're developing a whole lot of stuff in our Yilal studio and working with our Indigenous composers. We didn't actually have a performance this year, but we were developing some big stuff. We have a thing called the Grand Challenges, the Indigenous Health and Wellbeing Grand Challenges that we're working on. It's actually looking at music as a way to really change long-term injustice and long-term health outcomes. So actually trying to tie music 
into the health sphere with Indigenous work as we go on. How does music like connect with health and wellbeing? Well, this has been interesting because the uni put out a call and a $10 million budget a few years ago to say this is the pressing thing of our time. So actually we're going to put some of our core budget that would normally be spent on day-to-day bricks and mortar stuff to actually do this. And all the different parts of the uni got to say, we might be able to offer this. And we were lucky that our souls in the School of Art put in projects that were looking at a much softer, longer term version of Indigenous health. The idea that culture is actually what keeps health going rather than just sending the doctors in. But of course, we can be part of initiatives that do also send the doctors in. So this is working in a few ways. So the centrepiece of it is actually our studio. So the studio does two things. It brings communities into Canberra, but it also means that we can take a version of our studio on the road and actually turn up at communities, which we're doing increasingly, and work in and with communities at the source and record music and work with people at all stages of life. And it means that as we do this stuff, and we've been doing this in one territory as a trial, which is the Jigami Corporation on the south coast of New South Wales with Uncle Lossie Cruz, who's one of our great elders. And we basically turn up, and then we might have people from business and economics turning up to help people with their financial things. We might have lawyers turning up to help people with any issues they've got with governmental stuff. So it's this idea that the uni can come and be this great place of bringing about change in a community, but being of service to the community in real time. I think it's a really exciting model. So it's completely different to the ivory tower, isn't it? You know, this idea that come in and, you know, ask for permission to enter our exalted building and we'll talk down to you and study the natives. It's actually going in and getting our hands dirty. And for example, at this community, they had a really big festival, which was the Guyon Festival. And about 5,000 First Nations people came from around the country to look at Indigenous culture and music. And so we're able to send our incredible Indigenous audio engineer, Willie Kepa, to work to record the best parts of that festival. And also something that I thought was quite exciting. We had a special project we're supporting, which is the restitution of the great gum leaf orchestras of the 1920s. One of the things that Indigenous cultures used to survive 100 years ago was to literally play music on gum leaves. There wasn't a notion of playing Western instruments that was mainstreamed or or possible, or the Western instruments were really such arbiters of pain to Indigenous communities. It's very much, you know, it's part of the colonising aspect. But playing the gum leaf was a way to make sense of the, the larger world that was coming into Indigenous communities. And it was really huge to the 1960s. Gum leaf bands, gum leaf ensembles, and they'd play everything from First Nations musics to popular music of the time. And so some of the elders who are literally in their 70s and 80s still do this, and they came together for this festival to play again, which is really exciting, and we got to record them. So that's the sort of stuff we do as part of what we see our grand challenge into Indigenous health and well-being. So this is how we work. We literally just get in there, we get our hands dirty, and we clean up the mess if we can afterwards. Yeah. So, I mean, you're using music to bridge the divide between cultures, which is really great. I wanted to ask, though, What kind of response are you seeing from the students, particularly the non-Indigenous students? Are you seeing them respond positively? You know, that's a really great question. We get about three sorts of responses, and I want to preface it by saying something that I find really sad, that even today, in the 2020s, we get people graduating from high school who seem to have still learnt largely the history that was taught to me. I mean, it's not quite terra nullius, but it's very much this itinerant, savage sort of notion of Indigenous culture. You know, these are people who moved around, they didn't have agriculture, and they came in, and yes, there's been some problems, but us white men came and, you know, we might have done some mistakes, but we've largely made things a lot better. Ignoring the frontier wars, ignoring the widespread disease, ignoring forced enslavement, ignoring, you know, just this thing upon thing that really should be taught. So we do take it easily. So because of that, we have some courses. We have a course called Contemporary Australian Indigenous Music that a lot of our students take. And that's the one that really opens eyes because we, we often have on-country experiences linked to it. But you get to meet a lot of Indigenous musicians. But I have found after that preface that young people in our country right now, they just want to make things better. They're actually over the prejudices of the politicians of a generation or two generations older, they think it's ridiculous. They actually feel that if we need to transfer some power to our First Nations, we should do it quickly and we should do it well and we shouldn't just take the short-term gain for ourselves. So I'm actually really inspired by the response I get from people younger than myself. Not only do they get it, they go, what role can I play in this? We have an initiative coming up quite soon where we're trying to employ as many First Nations musicians as possible, but we also think it's important that we actually develop what we call non-Indigenous allyship, which can be a contested term. 
but we want to actually train settlers, for want of a better term, in the ways and the skills to be able to make mistakes well, because you'll inevitably make mistakes. We all make mistakes when we're doing First Nations work, but to be able to pick ourselves up from it and to be able to keep going and have a long-term commitment. So this is the sort of stuff that the school takes quite seriously, that also the students really love. And because we have quite a few, I think there's about eight Indigenous students in the school. I mean, it might not sound a lot, but the whole ANU has about 80. So it's actually not bad at our school. And with the six staff and lots of other visitors coming in all the time, uh, it just becomes a process of osmosis, that you start listening to First Nations stories And when you start listening to First Nations stories, how can you not be moved? That really does bring back the importance of bringing diverse voices into the university settings because that way you're exposed to those ideas and experiences. Even though I'm a pretty busy guy, I probably spend 20% of my time in my job working on First Nations stuff because I think it's really important that a music school is actually able to show that it has this commitment. It's not just us ticking the box for want of a better term because it's a fashion to try and do enough of the right thing to say I've done the right thing. But of course doing the right thing is actually getting the call at 10 o'clock at night and solving a problem, not going home comfortably at 5 p.m. And so that's the big cultural change to say that if we're to be a part of something we actually have to dance the dance. So that's a part of it. But at our school of course First Nations comes centrepiece but I'd like to say that it's going in all aspects. We're, we're trialling another program at the moment that I think is really interesting, which we call a pivot to the global south. You know, when I was a kid, it was called the third world, wasn't it? But there's almost no easy term to describe the fact that uh, 20% of the world controls 80% of the world's resources, and that that 20% has actually largely responsible for climate change. So anyone who says, hey, China is the world's largest emitter, yes, it has been for some time, but let's look at the real ratio of what's happened in the global south since industrialization. And we can say that the legacies of colonialization are profound and deep and are going to take another generation or two to really get beyond. So we've got a lot of work to do. But our pivot to the Global South is to look at all aspects of how teaching is done at a school of music and to actually look at diversity, but it's also looking at traditions that aren't the Western tradition as equals. So part of that is trialing that people who come from a Western background could and maybe even should over time study an instrument in their family that's actually not a Western instrument. So for example, we have a flautist at the moment studying the Japanese shakuhachi, which I think is really, really interesting. So there's a pivot to say that if you play an instrument, you should identify with other cultures, even if you're from the West, to develop these intercultural skills. But possibly even more important over time is the fact that people who are from diverse backgrounds could actually learn at a tertiary level the instrument that they thought they would never be able to learn in a Western institution. So it's, it's a long-term plan to open up a capacity, and to open up that capacity, we have to build the teachers. So it takes time, but this is a long-term thing. But we also, we've completely changed, actually, how we teach our music theory now. So we look at a completely diverse range of musics to study the concepts of theory rather than just the Western canon. And so that's quite interesting. And actually, our theory teachers just presented at a big international conference in London on this, and the response was fantastic. And people said, there really is something you guys can do in Australia that we find harder in Europe. And I think that's because we, without even knowing it, we're such a mature multicultural society. We can say that multiculturalism is a policy that really started in the Whitlam years in a formal sense and was for many years really a bipartisan thing. And we could even say in the more divisive places of coalition policy in the last decade, this notion of migration from around the world, no matter where you're from, to fulfill a skills shortage has still been very much a bipartisan thing. So we have still a lot of shared ground in this country. Of course, we have the vilification of asylum seekers, which personally I think is horrific. But at the same time, we have amazing things in this country that we can build on. And we have notions of cultural mobility in migrant communities that are really almost the envy of the world. And we don't realise it because we live here. Yeah, I suppose that's true. You don't really know any different if that's your only experience. Which actually brings me to my next question. One of the calling cards of privilege is that it's often invisible to those who have it. Can you offer some insight into how people can learn to recognise inequality and what we can do to promote cultural change and acceptance? You know, this is a profound question. It's one that I actually grapple with as well as because my parents were asylum seekers, you know, so I had this thing of coming from a struggling family to now I'm a professor in a university. So I am privileged even if I look slightly different to the privilege in the next office. I am privileged. And I first thing for myself was to recognise and be thankful that in this country we have a meritocracy of some sorts, that you can actually make it. 
So the first thing I like to say to people who maybe are in that invisible space is to start with the process of gratitude. I think actually having a spiritual dimension to our lives is possibly the way that stops that ethos of those people are coming to take away my thing. Because we find versions of that in so many cultures. We can go to India and we can find caste warfare, that you can find Brahmins talking about initiatives to give Dalits or the so-called untouchable caste of India, you know, guaranteed places in universities. And you can have people whinge at you all day, the same way that you could go to Gympie and have a white person whinge to you about, you know, Aboriginal welfare. So this is not necessarily a Western thing. This is a human nature thing. Human nature is that actually I'm not doing as well as I should be, no matter what statistics you want to tell me. I need more. You know, we're all a little bit greedy. We all have some notion of vice in our life. So developing holistic values, maybe they're through either a spiritual dimension or a humanistic dimension. Either one works really fine, depending on the person, I think is the first stage. Because what we're looking for is, well, I love to quote the Isa Upanishad in this, which says, see ourself in all beings and all beings in ourself, and we will be happy over time. Which is such a lovely thing, isn't it? This notion that eventually we need to get beyond what Edward Said called the notion of otherness. That whatever culture we're in, we tend to find some version of someone else as the other. And that's binary opposition of Roland Barthes and the, these sort of great thinkers of the French system in the 60s and 70s. In other words, good has evil, black has white. And we make a value judgment on language, whether we like it or not. So it starts with actually looking at these embedded notions of power. And from this position of developing compassion or loving kindness, which I think is quite a lovely thing to do, first stage is to say, I don't need to give up my lifestyle, my anything. I just need to open the door to allow other people to join me. That's the first stage of getting over invisibility. And it's amazing how profound that experience is. So I find that having an institution, bringing people together is it. So part of what I want to do is to make sure that the kid who didn't quite make it in the audition, but we can see something really interesting who comes from a disadvantaged background, and that could be an Anglo disadvantaged background, gets the chance to go to this elite university and to mix it with the people who went to an elite private school so we can get this sense of togetherness. And I just find by the time people get together and spend about six months together, very rarely do people hold the prejudices of their society when they meet someone who they genuinely like. It's just amazing how intimacy dissolves prejudice. And maybe it starts with notions, and I, I think this is okay. I mean, people write and say it's not okay. There can be for a dominant culture an element of exoticism. Hey, you're from India. I love curry. And the Indian just goes, oh, you know, but at the same time, the gracious Indian goes, I'll make you curry. And we'll actually really enjoy teaching the person who hasn't eaten the real curry rather than the curry that's in the Indian restaurant, what the real thing is. So food can be a really great arbiter of change. So I think that th these things work. And for me in a music school, we have this incredible thing that you can play music and you can come together in music and you can stop things that are divisive for a period of time through music making. It is literally astounding. So you can get over Islamophobia by playing and studying Islamic music and seeing the beauty of Islamic poetry. And I'm really fortunate at the ANU, we have an incredible center for Arabic and Islamic studies that we partner with quite a bit. And so it's really amazing to think that we have this access to incredible Islamic scholars. And I use that example because we actually have three PhD scholars in Iranian music at the moment, you know, which is a really amazing thing. So we say, well, how do we actually break down these barriers? Well, the people who come to Canberra are generally sort of white, privileged, wonderful people. It's not to say a racist assumption. It's very easy to become racist about white people too, you know. No one is responsible for the color of their skin. That's a foundational principle, but yet we, we work from that and try and change inequality. When we have a research seminar and people hear the beauty and the intricacy of non-Western classical traditions and, and realize this is the equivalent of my own, something profound happens. And I'd like to tell you the story of one of our PhD scholars who's actually an Australian woman who has got so into Iranian music that she moved to Iran for a number of years and married her teacher. This is what I call intercultural study, right? So actually getting so embedded in that culture that literally saying in order to continue continue this work and do it well, I actually have to be a part of this culture and be around this culture till this culture actually accepts me, which can be a problematic space for a well-educated, empowered Western woman in a place like Iran that can have significant issues about the treatment of women. But it's an amazing process to go through. And so our students are seeing this sort of thing 
happen all the time. Or they're seeing another one of our Iranian PhD scholars who actually only earned Western music as a child because it's that whole notion of fitting into this dominant society. Now studying the music of her culture at a very, very high standard and making sense of this disjunct and making music that is way better than the music she was making when she was a so-called Western music of Iranian descent person. You know, everyone gets to see this. And one of the things I find that happens at our music school is people uncover the hidden parts of their heritage over time because it's a safe space. So someone comes in and they're just like someone who looks pretty normal. And then they come into my office and say, an example was a great young pianist said, did you know I was, I'm half Armenian, half Iranian? I just don't tell people normally because no one seems to want to know, but I think you want to know. And then suddenly we have a talk about all that notion of what being of those cultures means in a, in a country like Australia. And the whole understanding of music does change. This happens to me all the time. My office is often called the confessorial office. People come in and they tell me about the intricacies of their life that don't make sense. I really love it because that's what music can do. You know, musicians are the canaries in the coal mine. We get to speak the song of truth to the wider world in a way that politics often can't, that even science sometimes can't. And so empowering musicians to look at their own little disjuncts to then be able to take on what I think is a sacred responsibility in, in their lives and our lives is a pretty exciting thing to do in a job. How would you suggest that people make sure that they aren't crossing a line into cultural appropriation when they're doing things like playing music from a heritage that's not their own? You know, this is a really great question and it takes some answering. There's a number of stages of engagement. There is the stage that we facilitate, which is there are composers who write music in traditions and that music is copyrighted and that's a composer of a lineage who's expressing the lineage in their music. We think it's absolutely fine to play that music even as a music student, because the whole idea is we're actually empowering the professional careers of diverse musicians. So it's actually really good. And to bring those musicians into music schools for people to see. I mean, I've been giving Persian examples, so I'll give one more. There's a very interesting Persian composer called Reza Vali in the US, who's really set up an avant-garde Iranian school of music making. And it's really exciting for someone to actually look at that music because it looks like Western modernist music, modernism being a style of music making that we can say is detailed, hard to play, requires years of training. It's basically like being a musical Olympian, you know, to play modernism. And so, you know, a Western musician can play that music and so they should. Part of what we do is we really encourage our students to take a wider view of what the history of scored music is or the history of jazz music is because there's a lot of jazz music that is improvised from people of diverse cultures. And remembering that jazz music is in its essence black music, except the majority of jazz practitioners now are white people around the world. Something between 70 and 80% of the people who play jazz are not African-American now. It might even be higher. That's a pretty amazing statistic, isn't it? So we're teaching this thing that was a black tradition 70 years ago to white people now. And the people who are teaching it to white people are... White people. We have one African-American faculty in our jazz department, which is vital to have one person who is part of a living cultural tradition that just changes the understanding of our students quite profoundly because jazz becomes part of lived experience. So that's the first stage. The second stage is to work out the protocols of working in and with communities. And the first one is to work out what not to do. So what not to do is to go and get a grant and come in as the expert and write music with those people. And that's how it was taught to me when I was a young musical student. You know, you're this elite musician now. You, you're the person who can go and do this. And I remember that when I was told that, I, you know, a little alarm bell went off for me. And so I've never done it in my life. But I saw lots of people who did do it. Or this notion of, I want something exotic in my next symphony. I could do what was done a generation ago. And our most famous composer, Peter Sculthorpe in Australia, his music is full of the appropriation of other cultures. It's not to say we won't play Skullhop or love his music now, but we can recognise that something culturally happened that we would not do today. So, yeah. you know, I'm not there to say cancel Peter Skullhop, I think he's an amazing man. And for his time, he did an amazing job in opening up these synergies between Australia and Southeast Asia and also our First Nations peoples. But we can do things differently. So then we say the real process is if you're going to be part of a community, be part of the community, surrender privilege and be ethical at yeah, all times. I mean, it's got to come from that place of respect and being humble. It's almost common sense to us now, isn't it? I think in the last 20 years, we've made remarkable strides. And it's almost easier to tell that story in music because it's an art form. Because in art forms, there's an inherent forgiveness that we can say in the end, it's only art. I think we can be a little bit ahead of mainstream culture, particularly in music. But at the same time, there's still a lot of work to do. You know, the reality is in Australia, the majority of money is made and controlled by people of our dominant culture. So if we, again, if we follow the money, 
we still see a system of remarkable privilege, although I think we can say that the music industry is changing. One thing that I'm really delighted by is it seems in the last 10 years, we have a notion that women become superstars and that's not only okay, that's delighted by, you know? So, so there's less misogyny about women becoming really big stars. I mean, think of people like Adele. I just think she's really different to what a woman star was in the 70s, you know, who was the sort of cute, quirky singer-songwriter woman. And now it's the superstar who runs the show. So we've got a generation of women who actually are really empowered, who are just going to say to the next generation of women, this is a given. So I think in terms of gender in music, we're on the cusp of something long overdue that's really exciting. That's great. Now, I want to ask one final question. What would a world with no inequality look like to you? I think in order to answer that, we should look at the closest things we've had. There's a community that I spend some time in that certainly still has inequality, but that was founded on the principle of trying to remove inequality that I spend time in because I find it a very interesting place to learn from. And that place is called Oroville in South India. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Oroville is an intentional community founded by the chief student whose affectionate name is called The Mother. She was the chief student of Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo was a really interesting guy, along with Gandhiji. He was one of the great political advocates for Indian independence at the turn of the century. So he really saw that India needed to move beyond the colonial yoke. But he also dropped it in the 1920s and saw that we needed something greater. We needed this notion of intentional living. And of course, Gandhi did things that are very similar through his notions of Satyagraha. But Oroville was founded as a worldwide intentional community, half Indians and half people from around the world to live together in equality. And if you become an Aurovillian, you are expected to renounce the cash economy, which is really interesting, isn't it? So you work for that community and essentially the average Aurovillian gets six or 8,000 rupees a month to live on. And you could be someone who's come from Germany, who's really rich, you become an Aurovillian, you're living on 8,000 rupees a month and working full time for this community. It's a really big difference. But at the same time, everything you need is provided. So all your healthcare, all your food, it's actually organic biodynamic food in South India, this place said you can actually eat better than you can in the developed West, which I think is quite interesting. We have an idea, the main communal kitchen is solar powered. So I think that a world with a lot less inequality has a few founding principles. One is that it will be kind to the earth. And I think in this day and age, that means until we come to a way of changing how meat is produced, that it probably should be a vegetarian or even a vegan community. I'd like to say strongly to the listeners, if we look at the world's resources that go into the making of flesh, how can we in our right mind say that this is right? No matter what your spiritual, other ethical beliefs are, if we want to be environmentalists. And I know there were some counter arguments that say they're food miles and everything, but you can actually eat locally grown vegetables or you can grow them yourself and you can actually be very, very healthy. The studies are maybe inconclusive whether you'll live longer as a vegetarian, but you're certainly not going to live less. And by and large, you have less risk of heart disease or stroke. So I'd say a big part of that world is a world where the majority of people would be treading lightly on the earth in every aspect. I think a notion of sustained lifelong study would be a part of it. You know, I work in a university because I think there are places that actually enable kindness to come, but rigorous kindness. So I think a notion of places that have lifelong learning built into them. So in other words, no matter what your role is, you're not just going to be on the factory line building the Model T. No one should have a job that can't change over time. You know, I think this notion of there has to be a structure of hope giving for people in the world. And probably the last part is notions of cultural exchange. I think a world without inequality can only take place if everyone has the guts to try cultural exchange, not in the sense of, you know, wife swap from those reality TVs, but genuine cultural exchange. There's a community in Scotland called Findhorn, which I also find really exciting, that I think is also doing really exceptional work and has been for for many, many years. So I think that it actually is possible by changing the structures, but maybe all of us need to give up our property portfolios or the desires for them to enable a better flow of resources. So we have to think about what do I need over what do I want? And that's where it starts. No one should go hungry. We shouldn't become Mother Teresa. That would be stupid in this world. But at the same time, once we've got what we need, no one needs five cars, no one needs five houses. You know, we we should say that these are foundational principles of a just society. And if we can't do them through evolutionary change, we should elect officials who are able to make those chains and take the hit and think 50 years in advance, not three years in advance. 
to be able to imagine that society. That would be a lovely world to see. I hope that we get there. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. It was lovely talking to you today. Can I say, really stimulating conversation. I wanted to really acknowledge this foundation for what it's doing because this combination of thinking about environmental and social things is really the way. We can't be divided. We can't just be thinking in disciplines. And that's what all of you are doing. So all my thanks as well.